Really nice to see you all here. Um, I'm going to be talking for probably, I anticipate, about um, 20 minutes or so. And uh, I'm going to presentation, which I'm going to open soon, but I thought I'd just let you see my face. Um, and then we'll take questions at the end so you can ask anything, um, anything you like, including uh, about the presentation that you've seen. So I'm going to start by sharing and um, just checking that everybody, that that's okay and that everybody can see that. Maybe Erin or Diana can just let me know that's good. Yep, it looks great. Thanks. Okay, so um, this is me. I'm Professor Mel Dodd. I'm, as Erin said, I'm the incoming, um, well, I'm the head of department. I'm actually new this year. I came in early this year. Um, I, you might detect I've got a, an accent. Uh, I've been working as a head of architecture at Central St. Martins in London previously for about 10 years. And previously to that, I was um, program director of architecture at RMIT. So I've um, zoomed around a little bit and um, I'm here at Monash because I made a decision to come to Monash because I think it's an excellent school of architecture. Um, and so I really want to give you a little bit of an insight into that. It was great that you finished the polls because I can get a sense that um, there's quite a few of you interested in the three year non-cognate masters. So um, I'm going to be able to um, give you that sort of insight, I guess, into those courses. So um, yeah, the question I, I guess I want to start off with is how can architecture and urban planning respond to a changing world? And I guess that sets the scene for this question about how architects and planners can be change agents. I think this is a real and open question that we ask at Monash Architecture and it's one of the things we're actively trying to explore, how we make a difference, applying our spatial intelligence to a broader range of challenges. And so we, we really do believe that architects should be change agents and that that is that we need to apply ourselves to some really broad challenges. Those challenges are fairly straightforward. I'm sure if you're interested in architecture and urbanism, you already know some of them. I mean, obviously, um, urbanization is, a, is a, a sort of main, the main function that we deal with is architects, but it's also a problem. Huge population shifts over the 20th century from to urban areas and the need to, to design urban areas in ways that are humane, functional and, um, and beautiful. So urbanisation is, is some of the challenges, as is sprawl. I mean, sprawl is a challenge and has been um, for some time. Uh, this is a picture of Los Angeles, but it could be out in the suburbs of Sydney or Melbourne. Building in, and what's, what's alarming about sprawl is it, 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 uh, it's, a, it's a decent living environment in many ways, but it's part of the problem of uh, the climate change. Building and construction are responsible for about 39% of all carbon emissions in the world. Um, and cities are responsible for much of that um, loss of environment and habitat, loss of biodiversity, car dependency, long commutes, inefficient use of energy. So these sorts of challenges of urbanisation are not just about how people are moving into urban areas and how we accommodate them, but how some of the forms of, that we've accommodated, so for example the suburb, need themselves to be considered innovatively, how we might shift to zero carbon for example and how we might live more densely to accommodate that, and what is good density. Um, this is an image of Brazil, startling inequity and social inequality between, on the one side, a favela, and on the other side, um, a sort of suburb with swimming pools and apartments. So we know that the built environment also manifests great inequity, and again, we can be part of dealing with this. These, these are social inequities, but they are manifested through the built environment and form the form of the built environment. And this is another challenge that we really want to um, consider. And even more recently, we've had to adapt to new and increasing challenges. So challenges connected to the adverse effects that we've had on our environment and the planet, challenges that come from global warming and burgeoning wildfires, wildfires around the world, not only in Australia, and most recently, of course, what we're all in at the moment and why we're speaking in this environment, the COVID pandemic, um, an unprecedented phenomenon that's totally affected the way we live, work and travel. So, um, so in a way, those are really broad issues, but um, how architects can affect or intervene in these issues is really important to us and how we can be part of a bigger uh, understanding and intervening productively in bigger urban systems is really critical to the way that we position ourselves at Monash Architecture. Um, and I think the common good is a really good way to talk about that. What can we do um, and how can we contribute to the common good? And 
One of the ways I'm going to talk um, about that we do that is through thinking about the multi-scalar responses that we can make to this complexity. Responses that are inclusive, ethical and sustainable. But when we think about it, if we understand the city as a very complex system, we need to intervene at a number of different levels. That means we need to intervene in the detail level and at the strategic and policy level. And as a department of architecture and urban planning and design, that's part of what we really can offer. Um, what are some examples of this? Well, I'm going to use some examples that really draw on some of our practitioner academics uh, on staff. And I think that really help, help, helps you illustrate the way we want to make a difference, but also maybe it helps convey the profile of some of the staff that we have here. Um, and that's, that's often some of the things that interest um, applicants a lot. So, um, you know, we work from these, these scales, these different scales from the micro, the detail, right up to the macro and the strategic. We work from the single dwelling scale. And this is an example from our, one of our professors, Nigel Bertram, part of the um, practice NMBW. Um, and he's an award-winning architect, the practice is an award-winning um, practice. This is a one, one particular house winner of the Harold Desbrow Anir Award from the Institute of Architects. It prototypes, it's a house, but it's also prototyping new ways of living. It's combining ways that we might work from home. And it's talking about environments that are the grade between um, the public street and the private courtyard. It's also about understanding how landscape and environment can be used at a micro level to uh, manage how our, our, our impact. So this is a house that collects water on site. At the other end of the scale, and also referencing NMBW and, and Nigel Bertram's work, we, we work at the scale of multi-residential because um, there's the single house, which is a sort of micro environment for living that we can innovate within, but there's also the community, the environment of the residential suburbs. Um, this is a fantastic project just finished um, and it's a series of seven affordable apartments for aging and disabled residents. Um, it's set in St Albans um, and it's on an, a single block. It's an emer it emerged originally from an Australian Research um, Council two year project um, and worked its way through um, a number of studios at Monash Architecture. It worked its way through the production of a book, which graduates and students worked on as well. And eventually it worked its way through with the partner Housing Choices Australia, a housing provider, into the production of this prototype building, which um, is basically the, the affordable residential apartments meet national disability um, standards and are really innovative. So this is a sort of innovative project on a middle ring Melbourne suburb. Um, it's with an external um, provider. It's produced a real building and that was all part of a project that was done within a university setting with students being able to intervene and participate along the way. So this, this so I think this, this, these two projects, dwelling to, to community, are a really good example, but there's more. Um, and this is an interior of, of those apartments looking at really generous social spaces. We also have staff um, that particularly focus on interiors and rich interiors. Um, so one of our lecturers and, and studio shooters is Matthew Bird. Um, he's from a practice called Studio Bird, which works right across um, installation, um, scenographic and performance practice um, to create really sort of uh, vibrant interiors, understanding materials in exciting ways and understanding the atmosphere of performance and space. So we work from those sorts of scales, the scenographic, the performative, right up to the landscape scale. This is a project by Ross Bruin, another lecturer, um, also a member of, of um, and founder member of Gilby Bruin Architecture. And this is um, Spring Bay Mill in Tasmania. It's a 40 hectare site and it, uh, it's a regeneration of what was once one of the world's largest wood chipping facilities, transforming it into a, a cultural environment orientated events venue which very much tries to repair the environment that was damaged. This project recently won three uh, Architect Australia Institute AIA awards um, this year. So I hope what I'm trying to convey to you is that for, for us at Monash Architecture, architects don't only design buildings. Of course, we, we zoom across a number of scales and buildings are part of those scales. Um, but we also work across multiple disciplinary fields, and those include science and humanities. So the sort of obvious ones, perhaps engineering, technology, construction, which are really about how we build buildings, 
but also, you know, ones that are maybe less clear, re regeneration economics, how cities come to form, what, how does urban development work and how can we make it more equitable? Also ethnography, sociology, psychology, and this understanding of place and experience as a human, a human environment. Um, so yeah, repeat, keeping going on with another example of this scalar change, uh, another lecturer, Jackie Alexander, part of the practice Alexander um, Sheridan, works at the scale of the room. This is an exhibition, Supershared, an interactive installation that was developed as part of an exhibition um, that really showcased proposals about how we can reoccupy the city. It was called Occupy. And Supershared, this, this installation by Jackie, um, took the form of a 10 metre squared loft space. And it was programmed through a number of space sharing digital platforms and really started to explore the implications in, of the transactional sharing economy within architecture. So it was a live exhibition, which actually um, you, you could, you could um, go and use this space, whether it was an Airbnb space or a hotel room. And Alexander Sheridan won this year, the AIA's Emerging Architecture Award for a Young Practice. And at the other end of the scale, um, our professor Diego Ramirez Lovering um, is really operating, I would describe it, at the scale of the planet. So um, from exhibitions to sort of uh, planetary interventions, um, Diego has been working on a project with a whole range of colleagues um, and it's called RISE. It's a multi-million dollar transdisciplinary project between architecture, health and engineering working across Monash University funded by the Wellcome Trust and the Asia Development Bank. And it's really looking at targeting informal settlements um, and retrofitting them with um, infrastructure which makes them um, their water supply and sanitation much healthier. So these sorts of environments where water is highly polluted and sanitation is poor and developing in on the right infrastructure um, like uh, settlements, uh, settlement and water treatment areas that are, use natural plants and environments to purify the, the uh, situation and create much more healthy if still informal settlements. So these are simple design problems, but infrastructural challenges um, in large swathes of the developing world. Um, and in that way, these are architectural solutions perhaps, but they're also wider and holistic solutions about systems and networks and forming decentralized green infrastructures in cities. And of course, these are all projects which, which involve people and co-design and the way that we co-create with, with others is also embedded in many of these sorts of projects. So um, we want to make change through understanding how knowledge informs city planning at a broader level. And hopefully I've conveyed that through some of those examples. I'm going to zoom in a little bit further now. I've given you an introduction to what we're about to um, the courses uh, in the postgraduate school um, that you might be interested in and just give you some clues in, uh, about those. So the Master of Architecture is obviously, um, we, have, we have two uh, pathways. First of all, we have a um, two year cognate pathway, which means this is the pathway for many of you who've done a three year undergraduate degree in architecture, you would want to move into this pathway. Obviously, um, fairly straightforward. Uh, just to, if those who don't know, um, it runs through 50% uh, of our core curriculum being within the design studio. So what we call the advanced architecture project. So each semester you take a design studio. Some of those design studios I'm going to talk about in a minute, but they might be embedded in some of the sorts of projects that I've just showed you. And those staff are all teaching studio staff. Um, we also have some studies units and we have electives. Our master's course is very open. It allows you to, um, to select the sorts of menu of options that you want to work on. Um, but of course, we have a three-year non-cognate pathway, and I think many of you are interested in that tonight as well. That's a, a super interesting model in which you can fast forward into a um, recognised architectural qualification. And it's really um, comprising the two years I've just shown you with an additional front-end year, which was, has two transition studios and some subjects, which effectively um, accelerate you into being able to enter the master's. So it gives you the skills in um, knowledge, in tools of design, in communications and drawing, in technology, and in history and, and theory, in a very sort of um, a saturated uh, injection. Um, and then you move into the normal um, 
two year masters along with all of the, the, the peers who are in that program. So it's a very nice, very popular um, selection. Um, the sorts of, I mean, you probably know this if you're at this, uh, if you're sitting here tonight, but career directions um, for architects are broad and getting broader. And we're very interested as you will have been able to tell by giving you pathways into really diverse careers. Uh, of course, you'll have the ability to be a project architect um, and an individual practitioner from small and large scale across private practice, government and, and um, larger scales. You can design a whole range of different buildings. You might be a specialist architect who looks at heritage or sustainability or even humanitarian disaster relief. Um, and you might even go broad, more broadly because we, all, we know by now that architectural education is a really fantastic training for project-based learning and um, design thinking, which we can apply to many different fields. Some of the work that comes out of our master's courses, I'm just really just throwing some projects in front of your face um, so that you can see them. The exhibition is coming up shortly. Um, it'll be online and um, face to face. So do come and visit us if you're interested. Um, we've, we do many projects which are embedded in regional and urban environments and projects. This was a live set of projects looking at bushfire affected regions, Malakuta, Genoa, and, um, and this one, a previous project from Maruya. So these projects really stem from the sort of small, pra pragmatic community embedded right through to the speculative and, um, and strategic. We, just for context, I know you're here for architecture, but we off also offer in our postgraduate program a Master's of Urban Design and Planning. Um, it has a, a a course map which runs across two years. It also has design studios offering 50% of the study. So it's very innovative. Um, and what, we, what you're also able to do within architecture is to dip into some of these subjects for your electives so that you can start to um, work toward what we're planning next year, which, which is a double degree in architecture and urban planning and design. So there's an integrated approach to teaching these courses and it really gives some of those um, it, particularly urban planning knowledges, regulating the city, economics in the city, and so on. So these are available to you as architecture students. Um, and as we know, employers now demand planners who can bring really fresh perspectives. And this was the way in which this, this uh, course was set up to really broaden our architectural skilling to urban planning um, expertise. Again, many career directions, I won't go into this, uh, many career directions in urban planning uh, right across uh, the a fuller understanding of how we plan the built environment. And projects in those courses um, are looking at regional scales and, and urban scales, which go well beyond architecture into understanding how we might transition from industrial lands to, um, uh, to restoring environments and habitats. And Giselle in particular um, was successful in winning a, a rewild, with her project Rewilding Industrial Land, a major award. Um, so I'm going to close and try and hurry up so we have a few a bit of time for questions with just some stuff that you might already know, but you might not if you're a new newcomer to architecture. One of the things I've talked about is how the course is structured through design studios for 50% of your study. And those were the, this is a spine across each semester. What is a design studio, you might ask? I've given you an image there of the design studio um, from, from one university. It's both a unit of, of a way of studying together collaboratively using a project as, um, as, the, as the subject of our study in design and drawing, but it's also a space we study in design studios. Um, that's the world over architecture runs, does, runs through this idea of design studios, whether it's Harvard or the AA in London. Um, this one in Michigan is a sort of factory floor of studios. Um, Monash studios are learning environments, so our rooms are places that we um, come together for, to, to do projects, to make models, to pin up and talk about the work that you produce with your peers and with your design studio tutors. Um, they're places that we um, present to others to have guests in, um, so they're very uh, interactive, dialogical teaching environments, and this is one of the, the sort of delights of architectural education is that we can do this sort of um, uh, you know, embedded study when it's not t it's not chalk um, on the board and learning in lecture environments. It's this sort of um, environment. 
And that involves doing all sorts of um, creative and practical things with drawing and modeling. Critical to some of the way that we work is engaging with experts, industry and communities. So our studios um, often are based on uh, live projects and, and we travel. Um, so for instance, in, this is Tasmania and the studio went to Tasmania to, um, uh, to, to do a project in Triabuna. We also do projects locally. So we've studied areas of Melbourne that are subject to change like Cremorne. And we study challenges to Melbourne, affordability, housing diversity. And we also look at environmental and climate change issues. Um, we've got expertise in understanding water sensitive urban design and a number of our studios have run in iterations around these sorts of challenges. So um, part of that is that we, we always, where possible, undertake live projects in our design studios that have real clients. Sometimes that is as much, that really involves working with people. So this is a really interesting studio that uh, traveled to um, Northern Territory to work with a community and understand how architects could um, look at a community and cultural center, working with indigenous people, with community organizers. Um, we also do projects that we call design make. And these are projects like this one at the Stowell Steps. Um, in regional Victoria, where we design and physically construct projects um, as part of our learning experience. So really exciting pieces of curriculum. And um, yeah, so in conclusion, I guess we put ideas to work in the world. That's that's sort of some of the, 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 the ways in which we answer that question of being of uh, change makers, being change makers. Some of the facts that I can finish on, I mean, we are um, Monash a vast university. It's got one of the largest ranges of degrees and double degree courses in Australia. So we often have transdisciplinary collaboration across health and engineering. So that might be very interesting to you. We also have a global footprint um, that includes a, a, a centre in Prato, a campus in Prato, where we have a, an annual um, travel opportunity. And we also have recently opened an urban design course in Monash, Indonesia, which is exciting and which may involve, uh, will, will involve some work. Of course, we're professionally recognised. Our master's courses, of course, holds accreditation with the AACA. And it's also recognised by the Board of, Board of Architects in Malaysia and Singapore. In terms of how to apply, um, it's, an, it's a fairly straightforward um, submission of an application form, CV, folio, and potentially interview. And that is broadly the same for the two year and the three year entry process. So I'm going to finish there. I think we might have a little bit of um, time for questions and um, I'll stop screen sharing. Um, and see if there's any questions that we'd like to take. You can put them in chat. Yep. There is already one question from oh, yeah. Anushka. Do you want me to read it out loud? No, I can read it okay. now. I've got cool. the chat up in front of me. So Anushka's asking, um, no doubt both architecture and urban planning are great, but what makes them different and better than each other? Hmm, tricky question. Um, I think that they're really good as a combination. Um, so much of what you do in architecture often impacts on urban planning and we think through ideas about urban planning. Um, so, uh, uh, but architecture deals with the built environment and construction. So you, you end with an ability to be a practitioner, an architectural practitioner. Whereas when you finish plan, urban planning, which is PIA accredited, you're, about, you're able to be a planner, but that's not a, a career that involves you making things. So in some ways it's about what, what appeals to you. Um, architects definitely um, are physical creative makers. Urban planners are projective, analysts and thinkers. Um, I don't know if that answers the question. And Tom um, has asked, uh, I'm wondering if there's an offering of history units on periods of architectural history, working in the planning industry on mid-century architecture and would love to continue to learn more. Um, yeah, we have, you can pick up as part of the, um, uh, we have history basically, we have four history units across the bachelor and masters. Um, in the masters alone, we don't tend to focus on it, but it does come up in our architectural studies units, the opportunity to have particular histories. 
if you do the three year non-cognate, uh, non you will have to pick up some of those bachelor history units as part of your study because it goes towards the accreditation. So definitely you'd be able to engage with some of that. And the broadly the history um, units do cover periods. So there's architecture in the city, um, there's 20th century architecture and modernism. Um, so yeah, they are, they, they, they base themselves on periods. And Meg has asked, what are you looking for in an architecture student coming from a non-design background? How can I ensure I put forward a successful application? I mean, we're really excited by our non-cognate three-year masters um, because it's, really offers us the chance to, to be interested in all of you. Um, I mean, they, we are interested in people who come from diverse backgrounds and who bring that intelligence with them into, into a, an architectural training. Um, so in, in another way, I'd flip it around and say, um, we're looking for really interesting, diverse backgrounds. You might have done um, an arts degree, you might have done a science degree, you might have done um, another sorts of design or, or fine art degree. All of these um, are skills and capabilities that add enormously um, we need we need to you know architecture is such a broad discipline we need that intelligence so I can honestly say um, play on your strengths what do you bring what do you bring with you don't think so much about what we you need to be an architect already but what do you bring with you and how does that um, how how do you think that might apply into the built environment um, so I hope that answers Meg Vic has asked um, I graduated with a bachelor of accounting my GP is not a, with my master's three years stream, wonder if I'm able to send an application. You can always try Vic. Um, I'd always recommend you try and get in touch with us to talk through what the options are. I think that's the easiest answer there. You know, we can have a conversation or we can offer advice. So always happy to do that if things don't seem to fit based on the instructions that you see. And um, I also like to add that we take the entire academic record as well and, and the professional experience. So we look at all the factors that um, an applicant has been doing and, and if some of the minimum entry requirements are not met, but it's close to be met, we always escalate that to um, the Department of Architecture for their assessment. I think we've probably come to a close. There was another question from Anushka about what level of folio you're expecting. Um, uh, I think it all, I mean, the, the, it's really about asking you for creative works and, and sort of um, don't think it's expecting you to be an architect. I don't know if Diana wants to comment on that, but we weren't, we're not expecting you to be an architect, just like we wouldn't expect a student applying to VTAC after high school. So it's about um, starting to think about what, what, what might appeal to us in projects you've done. There might be volunteering, community projects or previous work and using that thinking through um, a bit broad. Um, this might have to be the last question from Sam. I'm wondering about the process of getting credit transfer. I'm currently studying a master's at another institution. Um, so basically, I can answer that, Mel, sorry if I jump in. Um, with credit applications, once you've made your application with, with it, you can select that you're interested in applying for credit transfer. Um, we will appreciate if with your application, you can also, you can also include um, the unit um, outlines of the subjects that you are looking at being exempted um, because this will, along with the folio, this will facilitate um, the academic in making the decision when assessing your request. But it can be assessed at the time of application. You just have to select um, requesting for um, advanced standing. Great, it's been fantastic. Thank you for all those amazing questions. Um, I'm moving over to the urban planning and design um, info session now. And um, so feel free to join us there if you'd like to. If not, send more questions and really lovely to meet you all. And thanks for your feedback.